Before you get going? Yes. I think it's about that time. Welcome everybody. This is one of our Sunday afternoon with programs. And uh, the program is in conjunction today with our exhibit on immigration. And we are very fortunate to have with us Lorraine He Chorley, who is the fourth generation descendant from the first Chinese person to Correct. immigrate, yes. is it correct, here yes. to Mendocino, the He family. And uh, this goes back to the time when the Quan Tai Temple was built, and Lorraine's family is still responsible and takes ownership and looks after it and has a wonderful, wonderful New Year's Day celebration dinner every year which is a banquet that you just can't believe to help maintain the building. And um, <clears throat> Lorraine is a teacher up at the College of the Redwoods, teaching communication, and uh, has spent, I guess, many, many what, years doing the research on your family, and we're very, very lucky to have her with us today. So without further ado, we'll let you take over. Thank you. And I should say, oh, the, the title of her her uh, exhibit, or her, I should say, speech uh, program is The Chinese Contribution to Mendocino County, A Promise Kept. Wow. Thank you. I um, normally kind of go through an overview in terms of having people that I speak with have an overview of what the immigration laws are, but overall what were the laws that were created to prohibit the Chinese from doing commerce and also discouraging them from residing in not just in this area but in the United States itself. So what I kind of want to do is talk about the laws, a little bit about the laws that um, were in effect. And then in addition to that, then I will go into talking about what the Chinese did within Mendocino County as a whole. And then I'll focus a little bit more detail about some individuals within the community here and what their contribution was beyond the town of Mendocino. And then the Temple of Quan Dai and what its contributions and what it actually says to the town of Mendocino as well. So first of all, one of the things I really need to stress to you is that the Chinese actually were the only race that had municipal, county, state, and federal laws created to prohibit them from either doing com commerce or from migrating into this country or prohibiting them to even testify in court. So I'm just giving you a list of some of the silly laws that were actually created on a county level, level here first that you'll see is right here are all the kind of things that they created. We know that everybody has heard about the mining taxes that were created within each individual county, but San Francisco made a more concentrated effort to do in terms of Chinese pole method and carrying vegetables. Oh. There was a laundry tax. There was a cubic air tax. So, and an anti-ironing tax as well. <laughs> and so, because that was one way to, to discourage them from doing the kind of businesses that were being created within San Francisco, because they were making a living and making an honest living providing services for the city itself. But unfortunately, there are other individuals, as we know today, in 160 years, things haven't changed a lot. Only the group of people that we are uh, displacing or trying to displace is another whole different race. And so it's interesting that I talk about these laws and how things, when you look back how things haven't changed. You know, this is 2016. How far have we really progressed as, as a human race in the US? And so the interesting thing is the one that was really bizarre that I actually just saw a recent article about the cubic air ordinance. And that really was designed in regards to Chinatown. 
and it was to try to prevent any more Chinese from migrating into San Francisco. Because one of the common questions that is always asked is, why isn't there a lot of Chinese here today? Because there really aren't. You could kind of count them on your two hands in terms of how many Chinese are actually native born that live in this area. And what happened is most of the Chinese that actually grew up here that were American born and graduated from Mendocino High School, they left immediately and went to San Francisco. And the first place that they actually went was Chinatown because it was a safe place for them to be. They were protected somewhat by the community as a whole and eventually they did migrate out to other areas but at the time that they went down there it was a base for them and because of the way the Bay Area, Bay Area was at the time the Chinese really couldn't purchase a lot of real estate outside of Chinatown or even take jobs in the county because the county actually created law saying that you couldn't hire a Chinese person to work for you. And I know that my uncle um, Joseph, who was a post postal worker in the San Francisco city limits, was that I discovered in, in recent in the last few years, is that he was one of the first Chinese postal persons to become a delivery man because they weren't allowed originally to become work in the postal service. So I'm going to go on to the state legislature, and the interesting thing is there's a lot of things here. Is the miners tax that California had added on to the county tax. There is a fishing tax for the Chinese because when they start to do commerce here in this area, but all along the California coast, they were pulling up a lot of resources, and California was looking and going, well, there's something going on. It's like in 1901, when fishing game first was established, one of the things that they had discovered was that the Chinese were pulling up a lot of the red abalone along the California coast. And so when they discovered that they were pulling up a lot of red abalone, they're thinking, oh, we need to look at this and we need to regulate it. And so it was the Chinese who actually introduced the red abalone to mainstream society and as we all know, living here on the coast, when there's a minus tide, the population seems to double along the coastline because it's a prized mollusk that everybody seems to want to acquire, legally or illegally. So again, that was a fishing tax was imposed. In addition to that as well was all the other kind of, ta not taxes, but other laws that declared in terms of when the Native Americans, there was a law on the book saying, no, they didn't say Native Americans, they actually said Indian, but they actually stated could not testify against a white person. Well, when the Chinese came along, their name was added. And so they couldn't testify against anybody in court, who, against somebody who was white. So again, they were classified and ranked on the level of the Native Americans. And in also, within California itself, which affects my family, is that it was on the books in California until 1952 that no Chinese person could marry a white person. And my father, who married my mother in the 40s, she was white, couldn't get married here in this county. So they went to Canada to get married because that was the only legal place they could be married. And in Oregon and Washington, it was still illegal for him to marry her. And they came back, and they actually, in 1952, by that time, they had four children when that law was taken off the books. So the interesting thing is that when my dad had told us, and when they talked about them getting married, it, they were very quiet about it. And my mother, who just thought, oh, it was just nice and romantic that we went into another country to get married, not realizing that it really was not legal for her to marry him at the time. So in the federal, this is where immigration comes in. And one of the things that happens is that a lot of the Chinese who originally came here in the early 1840s and 50s, they came here because they had heard about the California Gold Rush. And what happened was that the stories got back 
to them, which were very inflated, of course, and it was saying, oh, you can actually pick gold up off the streets. You just land and here it is. And so a lot of Chinese actually decided they wanted to come here to become rich, get rich quick, and then go back home. Because at the time of this whole gold rush was happening, China was in great turmoil in terms of economic the economic situation, there were people starving, and because of the feudal system, there, were a, there was the difference between rich and poor. And so most of the Chinese men really felt this was a quick way to actually come and become rich. The interesting thing is a lot of people think that the, the men who actually traveled to California, and especially even Mendocino, which my great-grandfather came here, was the fact is they thought, oh, they came here to live and to die. In reality is that's not the case, that the Chinese who actually came here had no intention of staying here permanently. All they came here was to get a job, to be kind of prosperous, and to go back to China and be prosperous there. But some of them unfortunately died here and then later had their bone shipped back to China. And in a great example is here in Mendocino, there is a Chinese cemetery here, but the only Chinese that are actually buried in that cemetery up on what is known as Chinese Cemetery Zenith Hill and et cetera, the Catholic Cemetery. And the only Chinese that are actually buried up there are American born. And they are um, you know, relatives of mine. And that the Chinese that were buried up there that were not US citizens in the 1920s, the Chinese Six Companies was hired by families of these men to come up and earth, unearth those bones, pack them up in jars, and actually ship them back to China because their belief is that their soul would not rest unless they were buried in their homeland. And so all of those bodies were unearthed and sent back to China. The only exception that I found so far to that's different is not in Mendocino but in Fort Bragg. There is a Chinese person buried in terms of the, Dave, you would know, what's that cemetery called by Pudding Creek? Is it just called Pudding Creek? Ocean View. Okay, Ocean View. Not the one, not the one in town, but on the outskirts of it. Okay, Ocean View. There is a Chinese person who is actually buried there. There is a headstone, and it was the Fort Bragg doctor who paid for his burial, and nobody came to claim his body. So. He is still resting there, but he is not American-born, which is really unusual. So what you see here, what I've talked about is the municipal, the state, and the um, federal laws. The interesting thing that I want to go back and talk about the state laws, those laws were in the books for a long time. California laws, in terms of all these additional taxes, were, stayed on the books. And what happened is, we know, California was enjoying that flush of extra income because when those taxes were created, California was in a financial crunch. And as we look back a few years ago, California was in a financial crunch as usual. So it seems to be a cycle, but because they enjoyed that surplus of money, those laws really weren't removed from the books for a very long time. The interesting thing is that I want to kind of talk real briefly about is that the Chinese contribution <coughs> to the whole county itself was really that they provided a lot of labor. And it wasn't just, you know, being the typical laborer who's doing the laundry or being the house servant, but one of the things that they became really well known for was the cooks in the lumber mill. And the stories that I've been told by several people who are no longer alive is that the reason they were in such high demand in terms of the lumber industry is because they could cook anything and make it taste good, whether it was fresh or not. And so that was one of the draws. And it was a belief in the lumber camps that you got the best lumberjack if you kept him well fed. And so, again, that was a way to attract them. And I remember a gentleman that I spoke to in Point Arena, his parents had owned the Guadalajara Hotel back in the early 1900s. And he talks about remembering as a child 
in terms of what the Gualala Mill was, and this is the mill here, is that the hotel there, he could remember smelling all the pies that were cooling on the windowsills by the Chinese cooks. And one of the things that he had constantly was talking about with me, at the Gualala Mill at one time, he remembers that it was all Chinese men who actually ran that mill. And that they were, and then he also stressed the fact that, and maybe because he was a young boy, but he remembers them all being large men. And, I, and it was interesting that he had said that because it gave me some insight because there is the stereotype that a lot of Asian, especially Chinese, are very small. They're very short and small framed. But depending on what region they're from, the size will vary. And it's because of the diet that they had in China. And the larger men did come from the north because of their diet was much different. But it also confirmed to me in terms of the kind of group of Chinese that actually migrated up to Mendocino County itself. There were two groups of Chinese that actually migrated to California. There were the Chinese that came from the southern part of Hong Kong, which we know as Toy Songs. And so the dialect for them, a lot of people think Cantonese is the main dialect. It is one of many dialects in China. And the ones that came from the southern part of Hong Kong were basically fishermen. And so they spoke the tongue of the, in terms of Tonkinese. But there were other Chinese who actually migrated to California too, who were farmers. And they came from the northern part of Hong Kong, which is what my great grandfather came from, who was really poor. And he actually, his dialect was Zhou Song, which is really rarely spoken now. And a large group of those men were much larger men as well. And so the interesting thing is that the, what I'm discovering in the, the town of Mendocino and Fort Bragg is the good majority of the Chinese that migrated up here were Zhou Songs. And the next largest group of Chinese that I found that were Zhou Songs are, is in the Lop community. They were brought in the early 1900s to build the levees around the Sacramento River, and that was an all men's community, and they were Zhou Songs. And as it turns out, because they were from nearby villages, in terms of where my great grandfather came from, that were, <coughs> I'm related to several of the people in the Lop community. So what I'm looking at, you, what you're looking at here as well on how big the whole area is. And one of the things that a lot of people seem to, and especially people who are visiting us, because when you look at Mendocino now, and when you look at Fort Bragg now, when you look at Point Arena, and you look at Gualala, basically there's two sides of the street. So there's not a huge population. Whereas historically, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, all of these communities were quite large, and Fort Bragg is considerably still has a large population compared to Mendocino. But Mendocino, the U.S. Census Bureau, or the little thing that you say out there says it has a thousand people. But historically, if you look back in terms of all the construction in the town of Mendocino and down on Big River, those flat area, there were lots of boarding houses, and so the population was much larger than that. And that saying goes for Point Arena as well as Gualala. The interesting thing about Gualala is not only did the Chinese actually run the mill at one time, but here, this picture, the reason I have this picture is because there was a Chinese engineer. They called him the Chinese engineer. He's the one that ran the train to carry the lumber on the tracks down to the ships. And so it wasn't anybody but him who actually, and he lived in Gualala for a long time, and you can, on the photograph, this is really hard to see, but he is actually in the window here. And then there are a couple of other Chinese men who would feed the fire of the, of the vehicle here, and they are on the back. And so it's one of the rare pictures that I have found in terms of how the Chinese were really fully represented. And historically, there isn't a lot of photographs in terms of Chinese being within Mendocino County. There isn't an abundance of it. And so, unfortunately, the photographs are pretty limited. But this is one of the rare ones that I had found. I'm showing you in terms of just how the mills operated. I'm not going to go into 
great detail, but all of them were built near the water source because that's the way they transport the logs out to sea to the ships. And this is, this is the actual point arena here in terms of the mill itself. And then I'm going to go progress more. The interesting thing about Point Arena, they were not as welcoming to the Chinese as Gualala was. And one of the things that Point Arena did on a monthly basis, they had meetings on how to figure out how to expel the Chinese from their city. And so they kept a pretty active job of doing that. But before that really took place, one of the historical reports that I actually took of a gentleman talking about that the Chinese really did not just work in the mills, but one of the things they did at the Point Arena City Hall, they actually rented it so they could harvest the sea algae and dry it on the floors during the winter. And then what they would do is once it was dried, they would pack it up and ship it to San Francisco because there was a huge market for it. And this was, whoops, sorry, my thing is going a little too fast, and now it's going too slow. Mm -hmm. So this actually was a rare picture that I caught was a house servant that was for a family in Manchester, and most of you know that Manchester is just a, a mile or two north of actual Point Arena. And I didn't really find a lot of information about Mr. Mock at all in terms of what he did because there was really, this is the only thing that I could find that actually talked about evidence of the Chinese ever being present in that area. And I made the assumption because Point Arena was not welcoming that in Manchester he probably eventually disappeared as well because of the feeling of the community. We're in Elk, and the interesting thing is that you can see how large the community was at that time versus what it looks like now. And so the lumber industry really was a key factor for this whole county because there were these mills all up and down the coast. And then this is Cuffey's Cove, and it's, I was always amazed how treacherous, as we all know, that we don't walk near the bluffs, and here these buildings were built on parts of the bluff. The interesting thing about Cuffey's Cove, there actually was a Chinese gentleman there that was known as an informal banker, and he was, some people say, well, basically he was a loan shark, but in all the stuff that I've read, he was an informal banker, and what he did is he was, he was a banker for men in the Chinese community, he would loan them money, but he also had a small boarding house in that area too, as well, that he provided housing for them, so when they came in from the lumber industry during the winter when it was really wet and they couldn't work, they would actually come in and stay the winter at his boarding house and then disperse out. Then we're coming to Little River, and you can again see how large Little River was compared to what it is now. The interesting thing about this mill versus the other mills that were in the area is that they actually started to specialize in building redwood boxes for shipping out huckleberries from this area because it was a large commercial business. And I know that most of you are, would be kind of surprised, but when I had read this, I was really kind of taken back because I grew up on huckleberries in terms, as a child, and I know that there are people who still harvest it, and it's not an easy crop to harvest unless you have what they call this commercial instrument that had teeth on it that would actually pull all the berries off of the <clears throat> branches. But it was interesting that they had decided to specialize in that. Then, as we all know, this is the Harry Miggs. This is his first mill on the headlands there, and that was the mill that he had actually created, and eventually it was destroyed by fire. But most of the mills within Mendocino County were eventually destroyed by fire because their power source was fire. And unfortunately with Harry Miggs, he didn't succeed so well with this mill because unfortunately there was a time lag of getting the logs up from Big River to the mill site itself. Yes, they had, a, they had a track system, but there was still a lot of lag time, so the consistency of production 
was not as <clears throat> consistent as it needed to be to make the industry go. And so what happened was eventually that mill died, and this is the Page Mill that was actually on the flats of Big River. And this made more sense because once they floated the logs down, they would float right into this mill here where they could process them and then take them and bundle them and float them out to Big River to the mouth of the bay for the ships to pick up. And so this made a lot more sense. The interesting thing about this whole area here is that there are other pictures what I didn't put in here is the total area of Big River was covered with housing back to back. And that the open space that you see now at the present time is really beautiful, but there were stacked two, they're like, they look like three story houses, boarding houses to me, in terms of what was there. And a lot, a lot of Chinese actually worked at this mill, and then they also worked further up the river as cooks as well, along Big River, to help bring the logs down. Not only were they cooks, but they also were the water slingers. And the water slingers are the men who actually would carry the poles with two huge pots of water. And what they would do is they would wet the hillside down so that the logs could slide down the hill into the river. And they would actually swing these pots around. And they're the ones that were hired to actually do that, to perform that task. Now, on the headlands, one of the things that's growing up that I was told by not by my father, but by people who called themselves researchers that were traditional historians. And one of the things that they kept telling me, there wasn't a lot of Chinese present in Mendocino. And they kept saying, well, it's because the U.S. Census Bureau doesn't have them registered. But being a descendant of one of the first settlers here, and in addition to the temple still standing here, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, there had to be a large population here in order to support a Taoist temple, but also there were little bits of history that I would see as a child. And one of those little bits of history happens to be the cabbage, the Chinese, the cabbage that you see on the headlands, even though State Park has cleared a lot of this out, some of those descendants are still growing. And they're back from the 1800s because all down on the headlands, that's where all the open sewer lines ran, and that's where Chinatown was. It wasn't the most desirable place to live back in the 1800s. It is now, but at that time it wasn't. And every Chinese family that had a little shack down there had a mini garden behind their building. And so the, one of the hardiest vegetables to grow was this cabbage, and you still can harvest it today down there. So the next time you walk down there, look for them. One of the things that the Chinese here in Mendocino actually became very industrious with was that they had realized where Stanford Inn is across the bridge here was that this property here, actually all of this property here, became the Chinese gardens. And what they had discovered, there was a year-round stream on this property, on the west side to the east side of the highway, and that the stream would run all year round, so they didn't really have to get, cart water. And so they rented that property to create commercial gardens. And what they grew there, they actually brought and harvested and sold it to the community in Mendocino. And as uh, Jeff Stanford talks about the, the original cherry tree is still there. I don't know if it really bury, bears any cherries, but the original cherry tree that was planted there from the commercial gardens is still standing today there, still grown. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is that if you go there, no one really knows that garden ever existed. And it was about 20 years ago they, when the Caltrans was going to change the highway across the way a little bit. They had to bring a state archaeologist up. One, because of the Native American, to make sure they weren't hitting any midden sites there. But also, they had heard about the story that I was taught from my father about the, the Chinese gardens there. And so I got a call from the state archaeologist, and he had said, I hear that you know a story. And I said, well, what story do you want to know? <laughs> 
And so he had talked about, well, you know, of the Chinese gardens. I go, yeah, they're across from Mendocino, and it was on, I described the sides to him, and he said, well, I want to tell you that your story is, is accurate. I have found the tool shed with the Chinese tools in it, and so I want to verify with you to let you know that the oral history that you've been taught really is, has been validated. He never told me if he took the tools back or he, if he left them buried. So that, and the, that's the way the state usually operates anyway. So he wouldn't tell me exactly where that shed was, but he did confirm that that story was correct. Mm -hmm. So I'm going north because I wanted you to just kind of get a feel of how large Casper was at the time compared to what you see now. And so it is pretty massive in terms of the population that was there. And then we're moving, and there was the large mill family was there. They actually had a Chinese cook, and he became quite pro prosperous there with his family. Then also at the Casper Mill site, there's one of the rare pictures where Chinese cooks were actually allowed to take the photographs with the camps, and they're in the back of the windows here. And there are other ones. There is an, an interesting one, which I don't actually post. I have it in my book, but I don't post it on this slideshow, of three of the gentlemen, and one of them was the head cook, and he is dressed in um, Western clothing, and he has a huge cigar and a big cowboy hat on his head, <laughs> and he's sitting on a, a tree stump, and he looks like he's really enjoying his cigar. So it, it looks like he was um, pretty entertaining. And then you're looking at Noyle. The very first mill was down at the mouth of the river as well. And again, you can see how large the mill was at that time. Then what I want to kind of go forward is that the understanding that the Chinese were great cooks is that Union Lumber Company had decided that in the 1920s that it would be easier for them to build up by 10 mile a logging camp because it was taking too long to bring the, the lumber and to get the men out there to cut the lumber and to bring it back into the main mill site. So they figured that the men could produce more if they were living near the site. And so what they did was that they built a camp up at 10 Mile and they built a mess hall with all the boarding houses as well and they built a professional kitchen. And what they did is these two gentlemen here were contracted and brought up from San Francisco to work as the cooks for this mess hall. And in addition to Union Lumber Company having this, these cooks for the mess hall, they hired women in Fort Bragg to serve the men in the mess hall. And so it saved the mill a lot of money in regards to having these men track back and forth, and so they just come over on the weekend. Now the next large group of Chinese that I ever found in Mendocino County really was in Ukiah. And it, what didn't talk about any evidence of there really being a large population, but the person who really kept a lot of history was Grace Hudson herself. And I was very fortunate to be given um, the pleasure of being able to go through her personal letters as well as her photograph albums because she kept an extensive history about her Chinese cook, Mr. Wong. And the interesting thing is over the years, he kept going back to China and bringing the son back with him. And I suspect that the sons may have been paper sons because at the time of when he was traveling back and forth, the law, the Exclusion Act had stated no more Chinese person could enter this country unless you were already related to someone here. And the same thing goes for my grandfather who came in as a paper son as well. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Wong had five sons mm -hmm. and so over the years <coughs> these sons, the population grew. And Grace Hudson was a great benefactor to them just like Daisy McCallum was a great benefactor to the Chinese here within this community. And one of the things that she did is that even after her cook had retired, after many, many years, he still wrote to her and she wrote back. Mm -hmm. And when he needed medication, he would write to her and send her money and she would send the medication to him. 
because her husband was a doctor. The interesting thing is that she also wrote to his sons. Once they were grown and left the area, she kept in communication with a lot of them. And what I don't have here is that all of you know when, we, when you go into the store, there are fried chow mein noodles in a bag, right? And, I, and a lot of you might think that the Chinese invented that. Believe it or not, we didn't. And that it was invented in Minnesota by a company. And it turns out Mr. Wong's son worked for this company and they were canning these chow mein noodles and trying to market them to get mainstream to really buy these. And I have a picture of him with the car, with a sign on it, advertising these fried chow mein noodles, which is interesting. And the, also with these young men is that they really did have a bond with her, and they kept in constant contact with her as well. And there are stacks and stacks of letters from her that she had saved, you know, that they had, when they had wrote back to her in, um, in storage at the Grace Hudson Museum. So I want to come back now to Mendocino itself. And I had talked earlier about where the Chinese who grew up here were American born. And then once they graduated from Mendocino High School, they left the area. And very few stayed here. Even my father, when he didn't graduate from high school here, but because of the family situation where my grandfather took off and left my grandmother with 10 children, somebody had to go out and make some money for the to support the family. So my father actually left high school, well, junior high at eighth grade, and went down to work in the Salinas Valley in the farms. Mm -hmm. And then because the family couldn't survive without his income, he came back to work here to continue to support the family. And his brothers and sisters were allowed to gradu graduate from high school, but he never was fortunate enough to be able to do so. Even though the original agreement is they all would take turns taking a year off to work so that the others could continue on to school. One of the things that is very influential is Eli Key was the first Chinese to actually graduate from Mendocino High School. And Eli Key, as soon as he was old enough, went to San Francisco and became the president of the Bank of Canton, the first Chinese bank in Chinatown. And in addition to that, he became a shipping magnet. He had discovered, you know, in terms of what was in demand in, from China. And even though he was American born, he was really traditionally very Chinese. And so he even at, sent for his wife from China and married her, not marrying someone here that was American born. But one of the things that he took advantage of was the resources that were up here in the town of Mendocino. He realized that the sea algae, which was harvest, harvested here, the dried fish, and especially the red abalone, was in high demand, and he could make a, quite a bit of money from that. And he would come up here to purchase that, and he had his own shipping line, and he would load that on his shipping line and ship it back to China. The interesting thing about Eli Ki is eventually when he got older, he went to China and to reside and died. And, and he didn't um, come back and be, you know, asked to be buried here, but he was buried in China. The one thing that he's really influential is, and that San Francisco will note, is that when he was, well, you know, he was a millionaire in San Francisco. And in, during the 1906 earthquake, when Chinatown was completely destroyed, they, had, they were debating on where to build, rebuild that. And a lot of them wanted to rebuild where Chinatown was, down by the waterfront. And he said, oh no, no, we need to build it here. And he's the one on California and Grant is the corner of the gateway to Chinatown. And he said, no, we need to build it here because he had this vision of it being a tourist mecca and how right he was in terms of how 
Chinatown really was developed, but also the building on the northwest side, the corner of um, Grant in California, it's a three-story building, is his building. It's the original building that still stands today. And so they talk about, in terms of San Francisco history, and when they talk about Chinatown, they talk about Eli Key, and they also note that he was a graduate from Mendocino High School. Was, so, he, was he born here? Yes. And so when we go on, and what you're seeing next to him is also his brother, who helped him in both of his enterprises. And I'm just going to kind of quickly, these are pictures of family within San Francisco in terms of in the park area there. I'm just kind of thinking. What I want to do is go to this picture, which is actually my great-grandfather and my grandmother. And just to give you real brief, because I'm not sure what time it is, Anne, but... Um, I stood up to see something. You can go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, but I know people can't sit that long. No, but okay. anyway, my great-grandfather, when he, he had come to America as well and to California, because he had heard about the gold rush, and he was a poor farmer, and so he wanted to get rich, of course. And so he and his brother decided they were going to sail here to California. And at that time, what was happening is there was a trade route set up by the Chinese in terms of sailing to Monterey, because there was a Chinese fishing village there. And that's where, if they weren't coming into San Francisco, they were debarking at Monterey, and that route was already set up. Unfortunately, because my great-grandfather was a farmer, he went to the Philippines to get some really quick sailing lessons. <laughs> and so what he did was there were seven sampans that started out to come to California to dock at Monterey. Unfortunately, only two of those ships survived crossing the Pacific Ocean. My great-grandfather's ship actually got off course and landed up here by Casper. And then another ship, the other ship did arrive in Monterey, and that is that has been validated by um, Mr. Lyman, who is also another research person in terms of that, because he verified to me. So though only two of those ships survived. And because my great-grandfather came here with no money, he couldn't really just go off and to the gold fields, and then he discovered when he landed there wasn't any gold on the streets. But he did discover that the lumber mills were really functioning, and they were there was a high demand for labor. So he got a job right away, he and his brother. And what, what happened? What year did that happen? Sorry. It's in the early 1850s. And so what happened is that he actually just started to work in the lumber mill in terms of working in the kitchen and then also doing a little farming. As that was in Casper, and then he worked his way down to Mendocino itself, and that's where Mendocino, who was really becoming a booming metropolis, decided to reside here. And eventually he had his own restaurant. He had his own business in terms of doing that. One of the things that I'm always, when people say, well, there isn't a ton, lot of Chinese here, and, and the individuals who told me because of the U.S. Census Bureau's don't note Chinese actually on their enrollment list, that one of the things I can counter with, and I don't know, Anne, do you have that of um, Augie Heiser, but it actually was Francis Nichol had on a big board, um, a sandboard map in the 1870s? We have sandboard maps from 1890. I don't know that I've seen 1870s, but they might be here, but Part of our exhibit is some of the sandboards from 1890. From he, this one he had kept at the Mendocino Beacon for a long time because it was pasted on this huge board. And it was obvious, huh? Yeah. I haven't and, seen it yet. Um, I, I have to, I'm going to have to hunt that down because I know that he donated it somewhere. Well, Hopefully it's here and it's just... <laughs> and then it could be at Mendocino County too. Yeah, okay. So one of the things that he had brought out for me to look at when I was much younger was this, because Mendocino was incorporated at one time, and so there were the Sanborn maps that actually mapped all the businesses and buildings within the town of Mendocino. In the 1870s, there on Main Street was, that he had showed me, because they were plotted very carefully, there were seven Chinese herb shops. Yeah. 
throughout the town on Main Street. And so I always would tell the individuals that kept saying there weren't a lot of Chinese here, I said, there are seven herb shops. Nobody's going to patronize that unless you were Chinese, because what else would you know how to use them? So again, and according to my father, he always told me there were five to seven hundred Chinese here in the 1870s at the time. And that seems to validate in terms of what he was always taught and knew about the Chinese history. But the thing about my great-grandfather is that even though my great-grandfather was a bachelor for a long time, and that I have recently uncovered talking with family, because the Chinese are very quiet about history. They don't like to tell you about the bad stuff. And I guess they see it as bad. Is that when my great-grandfather arrived here, he was a bachelor. He didn't, there were no women here. And that his wife, who he is the mother of Yip Lee, he won her in a gambling game. <laughs> and she came from Monterey. She came from the fishing village of Monterey and came up here to marry him. And she, he actually won her from another man who she already had a child. And so he lost his wife to my great-grandfather. And so my great-grandfather had four children, and Yip Lee was one of the girls that he had. And if you look at this really carefully here, she has really small feet. And my mother told me that she remembers helping my grandmother a lot because my grandmother, when she got older, it was very difficult for her to walk because my great-grandfather had begun the process of having bound feet for her and then stopped because he had believed, even living in this country, that she would have a much more financial, beneficial marriage if she had bound feet. <clears throat> and actually, my grandmother did marry. She, her marriage was arranged, and it was my grandfather who came to this country under the name he, but that was not his real name, because he had paid someone to use their name to come into this country. And she was married at 19. And if you know anything about Chinese culture in those days, she was an old maid at 19. But she had 10 children, and that my grandfather left in the early 1900s to go back to China, because he had no intention of staying here permanently, and he didn't care that he left her with all these children. But the stories that I've been able to gleam through in a roundabout way is that my grandfather wasn't a very nice man and was actually pretty brutal. And so the children, as well as Yip Lee, were glad that he left. She was American-born, and so there was no reason for her to go back, because she grew up here. But she also had kept a promise to her father, my great-grandfather, that she would protect and overlook the, the Temple of Kwan Dai for him, because he along with his brother, had built this temple for the Chinese community, and there was, and it was kept in the family. So she had made that promise to him, and what she had done was that she had passed that promise down to my father, who came back here, and he made the same promise to her. And the reason I can say that so confidently is because my father would constantly tell us, before we really could talk, about our history and, about, and what it meant, and that he actually did the same thing, is that because he had told us about the story since we were very young until the day he died, is that one of the things that he made us do is to make that promise as well. So the promise, in terms of the heading of my title, is a promise kept, was <laughs> that for us to keep the same promise to always protect and oversee the Temple of Kwan Dai. The interesting thing about the family, and this is the temple that you see, and this was done oh, about 40 years ago, and this temple is a little different than most. There are six original Taoist temples left in California, and a lot, all of them have windows, but ours is up nine steps, as Jane always says, and it has to do with the Taoist religion of feng shui to be in balance with the wind and the water. And they believe that evil spirits can't climb nine steps. Whereas the one in Weaverville, which is an original temple, is built at ground level 
and it has screens in front of it because it's the belief that evil spirits can't go around corners. And so any Taoist temple that you see has been placed very specifically on the property. Like a lot of people say, well, this should have been built in Chinatown in terms of here down on the headlands. And as I was brought up is that my great grandfather had a priest tell him where that temple needed to be constructed so that it would be in balance with the wind and the water just as the burial site that is on the top of Zenith Hill, my grandmother had the priest tell her where the family needed to be buried. And it is on the very top of the hill. It's always windy there. It's rare that it's not windy there. And it has, if you stand there, it's totally surrounded by the water source. And the same thing, be this temple, when it was constructed with the windows, if you could still stand on the porch there's a lot of construction in front of it today, but historically it had a complete view shed of the Mendocino Bay and the opening and the rest of the Pacific Ocean. So again, it had a clear view shed of the water itself. And so that is really significant in the Taoist religion, that it's always near a water source. The one in Marysville is built along the Sacramento River and has this huge berm in front of it because the river would always flood. And so, like the Marysville Temple, they decided they got tired of trying to, you know, restore the temple because of the floods. So they moved it a couple of blocks away, thinking, okay, they had that would resolve the problem. But the end the story goes historically about the temples is that temple had bad luck. And so they end up moving the temple back to where it was originally. And so they, because they were told by the elders, you can't move it because it's, you know, it has to do with luck. And they discovered that the hard way. And so it's traditional for Chinese families as a unit that when the family starts to go their ways is that you always sit down and you take um, a family photograph. And we actually have one in the early 50s with my grandmother before she died with my father and his siblings, and he's done the same thing with us when we were much younger. Is that Raymond? Yeah. On the right? Yep. Yep, oh, it is. Right. And then um, it also includes my sister's husband, Dan, who was included at the time because he was married to her. Thing. And so this is the inside of the temple today. But to just really shortly tell you that the temple is now owned by a nonprofit corporation, which um, family members do sit on the board, but there are also other community members who sit on the board. And, you know, we actually, our duty is to save and protect it, and I'm hoping that I'm working on the fifth generation. We, are, we now have a sixth generation, but they're all a little too young yet to, to be connected to that promise. But I'm hoping that at least a few of the fifth generation, because as we all know, kids change. And so their outlook on life is a little different, but there are a few that have this promise already ingrained in them and that commitment. But the interesting thing about all of this is that this is 160 years old and it's still standing. And there is nothing in Mendocino County around here, if you drive around, that will tell you that the Chinese were ever present here within this county, with the exception of this building itself. And so this building will remain, and one of the reasons it will is because the god that the Chinese community prayed to, that they selected the god they were to pray to, his name is Quan Dai. And yes, the little translation is that he's a military god, but that's not why he was turned into a god in the Chinese culture. You are made a god because of some great feats that you've done when you were alive. And the thing that he's really known for in terms of when he was alive, that he always fought for the underdog and he always protected them. And the thing that he's known for in the history books, in the Chinese history, is that he swore a blood oath to two other gentlemen to try to restore the, the emperor's empire. And that what happened is that he was eventually captured and he was bribed with money and women 
and with power, but he never, he never reneged on his promise. And so eventually he was beheaded. And the interesting thing with this God is that I believe that he's the reason the temple is still standing today because he is such a strong protector and he's still very much an integral part of Chinese culture and especially with the Kung Fu arts in terms of he is one of the warriors that they learn about in terms of the oath of loyalty and staying strong together but also of his his skills as a warrior in terms of being defensive and, and leading armies. But the whole point is that this history will remain as long as this building continues to stand and through the test of time it, this God has allowed it to stand because 30 years ago, it's almost 30 years ago, when we start to do the restoration on this structure on the east side of the foundation there was no foundation. It, the, the piers were just hanging in the air. And so it explained to us why the building was leaning to the east a little. Because when we had pulled the skirting away and discovered that, we were amazed that the building was still standing because of the whole east side not being supported. And so, believe, and so I always say, well, it's the protector. He was m looking out for the building. And over the years, luckily, it hasn't been um, maliciously destroyed by anybody or actually kind of, it's been left alone. It's been broken into when I was a young, my father talked about some teenagers breaking in one time because he didn't really have a, there's not, a, there wasn't a great security system on the door and if you look at it, it doesn't have really huge doors. Uh, but we do have an alarm system now, but still there's something about the building and the God itself that keeps it protected and, and keeps it reminding the community here but reminds the community in San Francisco and especially all the Asian immigrants that are now coming over what was really here historically for our forefathers because the thing that a lot of younger generations as well as the ones who are immigrating here today they don't really understand what our forefathers really gave up and sacrifice for them to enjoy the privileges that they have today. And so I always remind my nieces and nephews that their ancestors really carved a great path for them to be able to do what they do today. So that's what I would like to end on. Are there any questions? open at different times to yeah it, it is open it's open um, from May to October on Saturday and Sunday only and as Jane knows it's the question of having volunteers and but it is it is so available. I mean you can just go at any time not or? at any time on Saturday it's open from 12 to 3 and okay. Sunday it's from 11 to 2 okay thanks yes um, Back then, when, when these exclusion laws were passed, I mean, was there somebody like Donald Trump around saying, <laughs> you can't let these people in, they're going to take oh, over yeah. everything? Yeah. There is one. Um, it's like, one, just too overwhelming in, terms in of San Francisco. They, it's called Mr. Kearney. There's actually a street called Kearney Street. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mr. Kearney was really a key factor in the union unions down there. And they, it's, historically it's known as the Kearneyman's Workingmen's Union. They actually came up here to Albion when they hired some Chinese. And he was actively, I mean very actively, physically active in expelling and getting rid of the Chinese. And he, he made it his life mission to make sure that they weren't hired in a lot of places. And even though we are pretty remote, the word still got out that there were Chinese up here, and he did make it really clear. And there was, in the beacon actually, talks about where he came up and threatened the owner, uh, someone in Albion, that if he hired the Chinese person, that bodily harm would come to him. Well, um, the, this, this, the other part of my question really is, is there any recorded opposition to to what these people did 
these exclusion laws? I mean, was there anybody that yeah, there stood actually, up for the Chinese and said, that's ridiculous? Yeah, yeah, no yeah there was. And I have <coughs> actually a book, if you want to borrow it, is all the legal rulings that they actually took them to court. They took them to court on the laundry tax. Mm -hmm. They took them to court on the miners tax. And actually, the exclusion actually went as far as the Supreme Court. And who um, took them to court? The Ch there were some Chinese gentlemen that actually did that. And there's a man out of, um, a professor out of UC Berkeley that actually wrote up all, a great book if you want to go through all the legalese of all the rulings in terms of the courts. Yeah, they didn't actually sit to back and die, but it took money. And the question is, it, because they were Chinese, how far could it go through the courts because they weren't allowed to testify against somebody who was white? Be really brave too. Yes, and in Westport, Westport, they always burnt them out. Literally, just took them and burnt them out. Mm -hmm. And it said that Roosevelt had repealed all of this in '43. What, you know, what inspired him? I have an idea. Well, Japan was fighting against the U.S. and also they had begun that war against China and yeah. there was a feeling of sympathy for yeah. the Chinese and they probably said, oh my gosh, maybe we should fix this. Right. Mm -hmm. so well, except it. the thing is, when the, the war, the interesting yeah. thing is when the war yeah. happened with Japan, yeah. one of the, th the stories that I have in terms of friends that I went to college with is that the Chinese actually had signs out saying, I'm Chinese, not Japanese, yeah. because right. unfortunately a lot of people yeah. just made stereotype assumptions, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of one of the things that you had to kind of really, mm -hmm. they made sure to, to, to let, there was that division at and that time. it would have been a good move for Roosevelt to have done that, right. showing support for China. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But we kind of repeated it by yeah. doing it with the Japanese of, of creating internment camps <laughs> and making the assumption all the American-born were enemies, and now we're doing that with Muslims, so... It's interesting how history has we, really we changed. Don't learn, we don't learn from our history. Mm -hmm. Right, unfortunately. That was my whole hope that people would draw from the migration exhibit was exactly what you said. So thank you. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Um, yes. When I visited the Angel Island, the camp there, and there was uh, part of it, what I learned about was that some of these Chinese wives that were shipped here had to be processed over there and they were forced to stay for months, sometimes years. And um, have you been to that restored exhibition? I, have, I actually went to it when I was in graduate school. I haven't been to it since it's fully restored, but it, it had a great impact on me. My my ancestors didn't go through Angel Island, so I never really understood. But it's interesting because, unfortunately, a lot of the elderly people who had memories of that never really talked about their history because, you know, Asian culture, you keep it within. You don't tell people all the stuff. And so, unfortunately, a lot of those stories have been lost over, over the years because of that cultural feeling. Yes. I just was going to say that we have a, um, where, oh, there you are, <laughs> that we have a, a video here um, that we show at the museum right now during this exhibit about Angel Island, and it's very interesting. Um, it's, you should come and watch oh, it. Sure. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's about, I don't know, 28 minutes long, but it talks, it it's from the island. point of view of a young boy and his grandfather, and he goes there with a school trip. And his grandfather comes back, and then they talk. And it's really good. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Sure. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for coming. Indeed, a promise well kept. Uh, we do have Lorraine's book, which is a collection of one of photographs and information and. And if anybody's interested in getting that, we'd be happy to sell you a copy. Uh, we are sponsoring another Sunday afternoon uh, with a talk on the 17th of July 
and the topic will be a little bit different. It happens halfway through our music festival, which opens shortly after the 4th of July and runs until I believe the 23rd or the 24th. And the uh, talk will be a 30-year uh, uh, summary of what has gone on for the music festival. And it's ga given by, is her name Marsha? Yes. I'm Marcia? sorry? Marsha? Marsha Tyler. Yes. And uh, it will be at 4 o'clock on the 17th, and you all are very welcome to come. If there are people in the group who are not members of the museum, we certainly hope you will consider joining. We publish an annual historic review, which is included in your membership, and you get a wonderful discount when you come to our events. And we also have a couple of special functions for members only during the year. And we would look forward to having you join us. And um, I think unless there are any other questions at the moment, we'll, we'll say thank you again. This is not about the Chinese, but what happened to all of those buildings in Little River? And you know, I mean, over the door, they burned down. They all burned or yeah, were torn down, or just I think most of it was fire. It's like there was the one thing I didn't tell you is Albion Albion had a mill down on the river. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing is that was one of the few mills that I found wasn't destroyed by fire. It was it was destroyed by wave because it was the first mill that was trying to be powered by wave energy. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah, which is really fascinating. Yeah. And that uh, actually, he's Augie Heiser did a mill here, and he tried to use wind power. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes more sense. So, yeah. oh, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Good. 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 Good.